The BBC has said it first became aware of a complaint back in May and then learned of what it's calling new allegations on Thursday of last week. The family claim the BBC did not ring them for what they call a proper interview after that initial complaint. Well, Andy Barr is an expert in crisis communications and he's the CEO and co-founder of the PR company Ten Yetis. Uh, he joins me now. Andy, hello. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, it's lovely to talk to you. Now, just tell us, this is an exceptionally tricky set of circumstances. It would be for any organisation. How do you think the BBC is doing so far? Well, I think it's, uh, it's drifting towards a disaster right now. They, they've not moved quick enough. Uh, they've not reacted quick enough. And they don't, they don't appear to have escalated it quick enough, which is, um, which is really scary when you think what they've gone through in their, in their recent past as well. But I understand that when you have a whole string of exceptionally high profile and let's be honest, very well paid presenters on TV and radio, some people might be motivated to make very malicious suggestions about them, malicious allegations. And it's probably exceptionally difficult to sift through these allegations, isn't it? And to do it quickly. I think it is, but I think it also reaches a certain level where um you know, you, you do have a risk matrix. Every company has one. Every organization has one. And if certain boxes are ticked, it does get escalated. And in this case, this very much should have. And I think this is one of the issues that are going to have to look at going forward when they're looking at their process. Um, you know, there's lots of talk about reform and everything with the BBC. There's going to have to be a, a good look at how they escalate things and, and what the real issues are there. How much do organisations in the media and elsewhere know about their employees' private lives? I would think that that doesn't change no matter what organisation you um, you work for. There's always going to be people in your organisation that, uh, that do things that you don't know about or maybe have post, uh, pastimes that um, others may frown upon. Um, and, I, and I think this is no different. The, the issue is obviously... Um, how this gets flagged and how you investigate it when something very serious is um, or very serious allegations made. I suppose what I'm really asking is how much should a good employer know about certain risk factors in some employees' personal lives? Well, I think um, obviously a private organisation is very different to, to something like the, uh, you know, the government or the civil service. Um, so I think you're only as good as the information that you're given by that employee. And an employee is not going to sort of out themselves of doing wrong, are they? The issue is that as soon as, as something is flagged and it looks credible and it looks real, you have to then, um, you know, get that up the chain and make sure that CEOs and uh, crisis comms experts and your legal team are all over this. And I think in this case, um, I don't think that really happened. But what about um, rumours that circulate in every organisation, every institution? There are rumours, there are stories about people, what they're really like. Shouldn't that be at least at least be somewhere in the conscious mind of the bosses? Are they expected to ignore this sort of stuff or should they? Should they genuinely be aware of stories circulating about certain individuals? I think that if a story does seem credible and, um, you know, and it and it makes sense in terms of it's something that needs to be investigated, it has to be. And I think, you know, you only have to look at some of the instances with the Conservative Party and where, um, you know, certain accusations were made about um, uh, Conservative politicians and, and whether Boris Johnson knew about them or not to know that it's a really murky area. And I think the BBC, you know, employs so many people, it's very difficult for them to, for them to manage everything. And as you say, when you operate in a, um, a high sort of celebrity world, it's actually very difficult to sort of wheat, sort of go through the wheat of frivolous um, accusations compared to the, the more realistic ones that you need to take seriously and do work on. But I think I can say with some experience from my own time in broadcasting that the more successful a presenter in particular is, the more their behaviour will be tolerated or ignored. And I think that's really dangerous. And we've seen that time and time again with um, with celebrities who've, who've been revealed to do things that are wrong. You know, this this is the, the be kind era, isn't it? And and really, people are forgetting that on social media and they're forgetting that in real life. You know, we, if you see something that is wrong, you need to raise it as an issue. What would you advise the BBC to do from this point then, Andy? 
Well, they need to try and get ahead of the story, but unfortunately they're very limited in terms of if the police do decide to um, look into this further, then uh, they can't really say anything. Now, if both parties decide that they want to come out and, and make a statement, that's entirely up to them. And I think that's what the BBC will be sort of encouraged to do, is to try and get ahead of this story and put statements out there that, that kind of feed this 24-hour rolling media and even more painful uh, feed the social media trolls. But uh, your assessment at the moment would be that they are really, really playing catch up and it's not a good luck. Now, they're on the back foot, you know, things coming out saying that the director general didn't hear about it until last week. Or it just doesn't paint them in a positive light. It paints them as an organisation that's maybe in chaos. And don't forget, this is, a, you know, probably the most globally respected news team uh, or news organisation um, in, in the world. But the corporate side of it is sort of letting them down at the minute. Thank you very much indeed for your input. That's Andy Barr, an expert in crisis communications. He's the CEO and co-founder of the PR company 10 Yetis. Uh, you're listening to Times Radio, 24 minutes past four, and the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte, has announced that he is quitting politics at the next general election. The polls likely in November, following the collapse of his government because of row over immigration. And it brings to an end his 13-year premiership. Danny Kemp is the Hague Bureau Chief for a AFP. Hello, Danny. Hi. So is this a shock, the fact that he's leaving politics altogether? It's a real shock. Um, I mean, I think people here are uh, genuinely quite stunned. Um, don't forget they've been used to Mark Rutter uh, for 13 years. All through that time, he's painted himself as a kind of, uh, you know, Mr. Normal, the image of stability, uh, you know, firm hand in a crisis. Um, and then all of a sudden, within the space of three days, they've seen the, the coalition uh, government collapse basically at, uh, uh, through his own doing, and then really out of nowhere uh, this morning he uh, he announced his his uh, he was going to be leaving politics, and we'd be expecting this morning that there would be basically a no confidence vote, which would have removed him as the caretaker prime minister, the very Dutch thing. Um, but uh, what happened in the end was that at the start of the debate on this motion, he stood up and said, "I want to say something personal," and announced to the you know, frankly stunned lawmakers and journalists as well, that he was uh, going to be um, standing down uh, at the next election. Just take us back a little bit. Why did the government collapse? What is the link to immigration? Well, there are two parts to that, that question. I mean, the first is that um, what um, Russia basically wanted to do is he wanted to limit uh, the numbers of family members of asylum seekers already in the Netherlands who could come and join them. Um, uh, basically, uh, the, the drawing a distinction between people, asylum seekers who are personally threatened and asylum seekers who are fleeing a place of war. Um, he wanted to limit the numbers on that very severely, basically because there was a crisis last week, uh, last year, uh, when the immigration centres here became horribly over, uh, overcrowded. People were sleeping outdoors. Uh, there was even a case of a, a baby dying in one of these uh, immigration centres. Um, so on top of that, you know, the Netherlands has a, a uh, long history of quite a strong far right. Uh, immigration has always been an issue uh, here, despite the you know the tolerant image of the Netherlands. And so Russia really felt that he had to sort of uh, you know to, to do that. The coalition wouldn't agree on it. There are some other parties, including Christian Democrats, who are absolutely opposed to it. Um, and as a result, they couldn't find an agreement, um, and so the coalition collapsed. Right. Really uh, interesting to hear that from you, because I suppose I perhaps rather lazily had assumed that the Netherlands was a tolerant society. But it sounds from what you've just said that immigration as a topic is as polarising there as it, as it is in the UK. Well, very much. And, you know, I mean, we, as a journalist, I spend quite a lot of time writing about how the Netherlands is, you know, it is not quite as tolerant as it seems. Um, it is in some ways, but it certainly has many of the same worries as a lot of other countries in Europe, and particularly on, on immigration. It's uh, um, it's it's a very polarising issue. As I said, you know, you've had um, the anti-Islam leader Geert Wilders, uh, who nearly became prime minister on a number of occasions, um, has always been a very strong um, opponent to Mark Rutte. Um, the issue of, uh, you know, migration, immigration, integration in society has, has always been a really polarising one here. Um, and so the image that I think people get from maybe seeing the Dutch football team um, is, is, you know, really a little bit at odds with the reality here on the ground. Right. Um, Danny, a listener here is asking whether or not he's trying to manoeuvre himself, uh, Ruta, to end up as the head of NATO. But I don't think he wants that job either, does he? There is the question. Ruta has said that he doesn't want the job. 
um, that he's not interested at the moment. Um, certainly, there's, there's been a lot of speculation here that that may 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 speculation here that that